When I was preparing for today's presentation on the monographs with Ben Cardell, I originally thought I would introduce it as an underground book that you need to have not only on your bookshelf, but also in your mind. But I saw that the Kickstarter he has going on for the second version of this book was fulfilled in less than 24 hours. And then I was looking at the reviews on the monographs and I saw hundreds of them, and I thought, this is not really an underground book. This is actually quite well known, and it's well loved, it's cherished, and for good reason. Because if you're into memory techniques, then you are almost certainly into the ability to use what you observe and memorize to draw not only conclusions about the information in the world, but accurate conclusions and avoiding errors that are almost inevitable if you're going to go about drawing conclusions from things. So, on today's episode of the Magnetic Memory Method podcast, I have Ben Cardell for a deep dive conversation into the things I think made the original version of the monograph so great, a little bit of insight into what's coming in the new version. And I haven't read the new version, so I don't know, but I think from what we talked about today, we have every reason to believe that it is successfully funded in advance, thanks to his deep insights into the nature of what information is, what is worth memorizing in the first place, and then what to do with the information to arrive at the best possible conclusions and to get yourself out of sand traps when you make mistakes, which is inevitably going to happen. And, you know, I'm one of these people who has a little pet theory about free will not existing. And I know that that topic can kind of get tedious and boring sometimes, but I asked Ben about it anyway, because I like it. And uh, he threw some answers at me that I'd never thought about before that took us in directions that I I, I think are, are, are quite, maybe they're not new, but they're fresh and interesting to me. And I really appreciate that, and it's the kind of thing that you would expect the real-life Sherlock Holmes to come up with, and it only asserted in my mind that he deserves that thing that people like to say about him, which is that Ben Cardell is the real-life Sherlock Holmes. So without further ado, make sure that you check out any version of the monographs. I I really like this one. If you look at the reviews, you'll see that a lot of people, uh, they have found wonderful ideas in it that just aren't in other books and then stay tuned for the new version which you can get involved in as we're speaking now on the kickstarter which is already fully funded so that in itself might be a reason to check it out if you're new here and you like this kind of information please be sure to get subscribed hit that thumbs up if you've got one under your screen in order to help the robots know that we humans still care about our ability to make deductions and inductions about how those robots may or may not be somehow, you know, uh, manipulating us more than we are manipulating them. That helps me continue to help you with more conversations like these. So let's dive into the deep end of what it means to be a real life Sherlock Holmes so that you can observe better, memorize the information that matters, make conclusions that are as accurate as possible. And when you stuff things up, you have multiple outs. Ben, so good to see you again. It's been a while. And the occasion is to catch up in general, see what's happening with the real life Sherlock Holmes, as many people like to call you. But also this book here, The Monographs, is getting an update with a new edition. And so I wonder, just by way of introducing yourself to those who may not know you, who are you? And (laughs) what is The Monographs and what calls for a a new edition? What what, what is a new edition as opposed to (laughs) another book with a different title? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, thank you very much for for having me back. I uh, do appreciate it. It's wonderful to catch up. Um, yeah, God, to to summarise myself in a few sentences, because Lord knows I do love to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm 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 basically uh, a, an obsessive uh, nerd. That's that I think I think that would be the fairest way of describing kind of what I am. Um, 
and and the, the the practices that I developed were born out of out of a love uh, and, a, and a and a fascination for the the kind of ethos and awe that the character of of Sherlock Holmes incites uh, within people. This this individual that could you know within a few seconds see through to your very core and um so for one kind of personal reason or another i set about at a very young age trying to figure out if that was possible in the best way that that my uh you know my young and cumbersome self could <laughs> right, right and um it's it's kind of led into into several approaches that i use that is akin to the ways mm. of of Sherlock Holmes uh, and and how I believe or you know a certain degree of literary research indicates he may have approached certain 21st century problems uh, that, that way around so yeah I I spend my days as uh, as a as an investigator as a as a teacher as a as a coach uh, and as a mentalist um right practicing and developing and using these methods to uh, al almost put my money where my mouth is uh, mm. at, at the best of times. The first monographs was uh, a, a, maybe a vain attempt to try and put together something that I would have wanted when, when I started this, because there are many books out there, wonderful books, bear in mind, that, that address how to think like Sherlock Holmes, so much so that it be, kind of became like uh, a buzzword of sorts, mm. that when you hear things like body language or lie detection, or it comes with this, ooh, that's, that's kind of interesting uh, in that way around. And the, uh, the, the book's approach to a few basic memory techniques, uh, a few basic riddles to solve, nothing that I felt got to the heart of... Uh, how he would approach thinking about something, how he would think about these particular things when they occurred. So that was that was the the, the reason for the monographs. And if, if you'll just bear with me a sec, I can show you the reason for uh, oh yes the the, the the second one. Yeah, I, I got my I got my. This is the only one. <laughs> I got my I got my proof through the door. Um, a few days ago now. Yeah, it looks great. And so the, thank you very much. The, I, like, I, I was particularly, just as a side note, I was particularly fond uh, of the image that was created because the artists in question said that they uh, they chose to put the little bracelets on the guy, like how I wear, and he has uh, kind of... Oh, that's the yeah, there is nature. a hint of tattoo there. <laughs> there is, much like, right, much right, like right. myself. And um, yeah, so the, the the reason for the second one is um, is is indication of growth in the material. I've I've always been somebody with the, the with the people that train with me. It's it's not about um, me imparting something or me teaching something. It is about me saying, "Hey, here's this wonderful thing that will allow you to go and do X, Y, and Z." go and test it go and break it see if see if i'm onto something see if i need to be changed or shaped by how it works in your culture or your job role or xyz whatever it is and so the the second one is very much a um a progression of the material um right. I, there's more things to say uh, <laughs> in that way around i wouldn't have wasted anybody's time with the second one if if there weren't uh, sorry if there wasn't uh, anything else to say uh, on on the topics it's it's it follows the same framework um uh, as in the 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 kinds of chapters that are in there um but the ones that i've cut out uh, from it that don't need they, they they don't need to be addressed because i'm saying they don't need to be addressed they could have been addressed but they don't need to be addressed because there is so much more gone into a different chapter and i didn't want to make the book like a behemoth of mm. sorts <laughs> yeah you know i mean i wanted to make it something that yeah, people could digest quite easily right, right. well i think uh that's very wise especially in our era of uh, time being strangely an issue for for a lot of people i i, I really like big books but uh so do i 
concision has its place for sure. One of the things that I notice in looking at the monographs again is, you know, a lot of these books about deduction or critical thinking and so forth, they're really kind of, mm, they're not really about, they're, they're just like, hey, pay more attention. And you are saying two things, I think, at the same time, which is these are the things to pay attention to. And then there's the, the quality of the thing. Because one of the, I think one of the problems with critical thinking is that critical thinking is, is absolutely useless if the data isn't of a certain quality, right? Uh, and there's almost a sense that I have in rereading it that you, you have a, a keen sense of where data becomes information and then when information can be turned into knowledge and then the passage into wisdom, so to speak, which always needs to be challenged. Uh, you know, so there's that, that sort of, it, it's beyond deduction, I would say. But anyway, I just riff with you on those things. But that's what it seems to me that the core difference here is, is this making sure that what you're observing is actually worth drawing deductions from, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> would that be a fair character characterization? I, 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 I would completely agree. I, I would completely agree. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a, akin to my hatred for the term mindfulness. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just as the term, the, the topic, I'm, I'm quite fond of reading about. But when it came down to some of the books that I would, that, that I would look at, they, they kind of boiled down to, okay, be more mindful. Mm. Right. <laughs> you know kind of tell me what to do and, and don't get me wrong it's not like i've read every book on the topic but the, after you get after you get through kind of like 10 to 12 of them and they're all pretty much saying the similar thing you know mm. it, it develops a, a a bit of a knee-jerk reaction there so mm. with with a topic that is potentially as vast as uh, uh as this one as in the uh uh the, the wealth of things that we could look at because I could observe anything. <laughs> right. I would need to know where to direct this thing that we call attention to. Um, and the, the great thing about the way humans function in, in my experience of this area is we're very quick to decide what is pertinent and what is not towards whatever task it is that we're doing you know if if it is that we're just going into the kitchen to make a a, a cup of coffee or, or whatever it is we don't tend to pay much attention to the bread bin that's on the other side where we usually get up our, our bread for toast from and this this type of thing mm -hmm. so it was it was really to kind of expand on that understanding of your purpose in a moment Holmes was a man that was written about who always had a very singular purpose in mind to, to whatever it is that we do. And it, 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 it comes back to this thing of uh, this thing for me, uh, sorry. Um, like why do we never take notes when we're watching films or binge watching a TV show? Unless you're like a film critic or something. Fair, uh, I took enough. notes all the time when I was a film professor and uh... yeah, <laughs> I really don't watch movies anymore, but uh, not often. But I, I think uh, it was quite uh, unusual. I always had a, or people thought it was unusual. I have this little pad that I'm writing in the dark. I trained myself to be able to write in the dark and and read what I was writing later. No, fair play. That's quite that's quite a skill in and of itself. Well, I had to figure <laughs> out a way because I would look at my notes later and I would just think, "What the hell is this?" Right. Um, Very true. It doesn't really Very take true. that much training. It's all in the pinky. <laughs> The guide, yeah, no, I can see why that would work. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. I like it. <laughs> I thought, I thought about um, because I, I, I'm digressing. I'll get back to the point as well. I thought about uh, uh, teaching myself how to read Braille mm. for the moments when uh, I'm on a train or something, and the train goes through a, a tunnel, and I, I can't always see what I'm reading, uh, just so I could carry on. <laughs> really. right, right. Um, but that's more of a side note. That the the, the the access point in that area was um, most most people when they're watching a film 
they will sit down and they will take in two hours of data of what character said what to who and who was wearing what and how this scene unfolded and what this location looked like. And yet when it comes to these moments in real life, Mm. We struggle to utilize and process all of this information and the, the the singular purpose becomes clear. When you sit down, put a film on, whatever mental processes you have to go through, whatever individual words that is that guides your purpose, it is, I am about to enjoy this. That, that happens in the moment. That's why some people can't maintain conversation because they're paying attention to a, a, a film and this purpose guides and frames how we process all of this information uh, that we see on a day-to-day -day mm. basis. So there's a, there's a lot of factors, particularly within the reasoning chapter of the second one, um, that will kind of go through a, a, a process of how you can develop these guides. Because, yes, can, can you induce inductively uh, information out of somebody's, I don't know, uh, what's ridiculous, shoelaces. Sure, right? <laughs> is, that, is, is that pertinent to the overall task of understanding whether or not this person has stolen office supplies? Right. No. <laughs> <laughs> Unless no, they... <laughs> Unless those office supplies were bound by shoelaces and <laughs> re reported <Yeah>. missing <laughs> as part of the uh, uh, part of uh, part of the uh, itinerary, or not the itinerary, but the uh, the list. Yeah, the brief. On, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, th this is the kind of things. So it, it led to this adage that I like to live by, in that everything is relevant mm. until it. Uh, and okay. it, I I like the approach and i'm i'm still at the moment where i can't really decide if it's a personal thing or if it's been guided by the research that i've done where these lines meet i don't really know consciously at this stage um but i, I like not to argue with my unconscious when it happens you know, if it is that I've noticed somebody's shoelaces in order for me to decide whether that's pertinent, I must first have briefly analyzed the information that's connected to it, and then I can move on, and my purpose remains uh, singular and clear, and I can frame everything in that way, much like we do when we're driving. You know, we, we, we do all of these differing motor skills of change gear and indicate and mirrors and all this and taking in all of all of the information that's in front of us when you know we could words to the effect of driving safely might be our, our, our singular purpose at that moment it's it's comprised of a great many lessons and a great many things that have gone into that but if it is that you notice um you know there's a giant ferris wheel uh in in the uh, in in the corner somewhere mm. you don't drive down the road paying attention to that because it robs you of what it is that you're there to do but in order to know that you've got to notice that, that there's a ferris wheel there in the first place whether that be periphery or a brief glance or or whatever to maintain uh these this the, the kind of track right, that right. way around yeah it's interesting you mentioned the film thing maybe a bit random but nonetheless i think useful to think about i think it's frederick jameson has a book called signatures of the visible and in that, he, he has this term that I've never forgotten, which is signifying by distraction. And his his idea there, if I, if I recall it, is that Hitchcock would have these irrelevant details around that are of great relevance once you know the whole story. And so I think in Vertigo, what Jameson is seizing upon in this book is how that sometimes there'll be like a garage door that's just slightly open. And even that is not necessarily re relevant, but it's kind of like making this creepy feeling or it's, it, it's, it's part of the mood, the atmosphere and so forth. And it ha has, a, I think, what he calls a geopolitical aesthetic. So again, like I said, it's kind of like this random thought that's coming up, but why I think it connects in some level is because, you know, I'm looking at your room here behind you, your mise-en-scene, so to speak, <laughs> you know, that, 
I, I can't quite tell, but it keeps drawing my attention to me. But th there's a little box there that looks a lot like a harmonica box, but I don't know if it, it is. is. Yeah. Okay, it is. <laughs> so have, now I have three. Oh, three harmonicas nonetheless. Oh, so it's more than one harmonica box. Right? <laughs> yeah, because I think I have yeah. that exact same harmonica that's in the white case there in the middle. Um, yeah, that's partly why I recognized it because of the branding. Nice. Uh, yeah. But you know, what is it? What is it telling me? What does it signify about you? I don't. I don't know that I ever knew before this moment that you were a harmonica man. But are you, or is it just? you know, that you happen to have found them on the street three hours ago, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. So where, Absolutely. where are these thoughts, th these things that are signifying to me to the point of distraction, like what could I do without giving away my investigative uh, urge here or, or what I'm trying to do here to, to derive what it is without, you know, giving away that I'm investigating you, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that, yeah, that was a really bad way of describing it. <laughs> no, 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 I, I completely get it. It's, it's, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, a, a kind of a duality of, of, of purpose there for me. It, it and it's, it, it kind of comes out to the fallacy of um, the, that, that buzzword of, of body language in that you can learn these equivalences for human behavior. Mm. no <laughs> that right, humans right. don't work that way. they're not equations you know if somebody does this it doesn't automatically mean that they are you know disgruntled uh, in, in in any way in the same way that if you see a harmonica it does not ultimately mean that what that one person that you can see plays the the, the harmonica in that way and um my my, my good friend uh jim wenzel is a colleague of mine um He's a he's a, a marine held every job in in pretty much uh, American law enforcement that you can that you can hold to the best of my knowledge prison warden detective boots on the ground uh, a policeman the man has a wealth of experience and he describes it as um, VDC you validate dismiss or clarify what it is that you've seen. So maybe it is that you've seen harmonica and thought Ben plays the harmonica. How then does your interaction best frame your ability to validate, dismiss, or clarify that notion? Is it the situation that is speaking to a direct question? Uh, ben, you play the harmonica. That's really a pass or fail moment mm. <laughs> right, right. In, in, in those kind of situations, which will directly connect to your purpose. Right. If you are, if this, this social uh, situation that we're having, that kind of direct question would be perfectly acceptable. But if it was that, you know, this is a ridiculous example, but playing the harmonica indicated your guilt of something in, in some way, you would be better served by the more indirect approach of how you would validate dismiss or clarify that kind of information of figuring it out you know that it forces you to question something for more than what it initially pretends to be it is something as well that the initial idea for uh, the reasoning channel that i developed i call it drop down reasoning but that's that's neither here nor there the the, the initial idea for this when you are consider the variables for a single thing that you've seen came from uh, the improv comedy show whose line is it anyway mm. uh, are, you, are you familiar uh, enough so they, to know to know whatever you might say about it or derive some deduction or induction so, <laughs> you, you know the game props where they they give the actors these ridiculously misshapen inflatable things and they are forced to go back and forth to create some quick little comedic moment about it. Like this inflatable item might be an animal in one scene and then a weapon in the next, and then, you know, a hat in the next and this type of thing. So when, uh, when I, when I see a cup on a table, I'm asking my question, my, my question in my head, what is that cup? Mm. Is it just a vessel for liquid 
or is it you know is it an indication of my 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 comic book uh, uh, fan fandom side is it an indication of a quirky personality is it an indication of right-handed left-handed is it an indication of uh, other actions on the table based on where it sits is it an indication of how clean the environment is based on how dried or how clean this stuff is on the inside you know all of these other elements become these very important factors that will inform how I interact with something as seemingly inane as as a cup on a table and as seemingly inane as a as a as a few harmonicas uh, on the side uh, to kind of pull back the curtain on it um the 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 white box and the one underneath mm. was was something I had as a child uh i'm 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 from a very musical family the singers instrument players abound throughout my heritage and uh i don't know maybe 3 weeks ago 4 weeks ago i became quite obsessed with blues music mm -hmm. and <laughs> i i bought the uh, the the black harmonica in the middle i thought i'm going to teach myself how to play the harmonica um you know i i have a i have an okay memory this this should be <laughs> this should be this should be an easy thing um so yeah that's that's the reason why they sit there and how is that going are you using any mnemonics to encode in your mind the the rules that govern the correct or at least passable performance of the harmonica <laughs> i am yeah i am um uh you know the 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 way and let me just preface by saying I've only looked at tabs, so not the proper written uh, music of it so far. Mm. And the way that they're written is on the specific numbers that they go up. They go up the harmonica with whether you should be breathing in, or, or whether you should sorry whether you should be breathing in, or yeah. whether you should be breathing out uh, at that particular stage. And so yeah, there's there's a series of images and journeys that I developed. Uh, to 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 use there <laughs> many a many a bugs bunny cartoon has definitely been used in in in, in those particular journeys of <laughs> gathering one's breath at a particular moment <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would be good he'd be good for b and b flat and all that sort of, absolutely. <laughs> sort of stuff absolutely <laughs> he's, he's had a hammer or two to flatten things out that's for sure <laughs> yeah speaking yeah, that's, of uh that's, that's... memory palaces you talk yes, about sir. You know, when you come up with a memory palace and you derive a memory palace in the monographs, you say, write it down immediately. The uh, the journey that you're coming up with. Has anything changed in all your years of practice with mnemonics and memory palaces? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd like, because of the way that I break down this this type of thing, I, I, I kind of changed uh, my own descriptive terms of it. So, like, when I'm... When I'm when I'm talking about journeys and then a palace, the palace is the housing room for, for all of these journeys uh, in, in that way. Yeah. Um, but uh, kind of my thinking changed around when we were making uh, season three of my web series, uh, which, which is a good few years ago now, in that the point of a memory palace is to be empty. Uh as as a as a as a drive towards it the the memory palace as the way that i kind of understood it from the sherlockian point of view was a housing unit for all of this wealth of information that he could call upon at a moment's notice brilliant fabulous to have all of that to hand is like to have a smartphone in your head i'm a big fan of all of it but Ultimately, my goal should be to stop it being something that I have to remember and make it be information that I would just know, mm. like my name or, you know, uh, how to travel around my house. This yeah. this type of information, I, it, the, the, the memory palace became something that was, you know, if, if we think of the practices of consolidation as is input process and then storage mm. it, it would make the 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 input aspect bigger in that way mm. so i i could look at the harmonica and take in the basics in, in in a few minutes and then just focus on how it is to 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 play and how it feels in that moment 
I, so I'm not thinking about, well, this is the next stage on the journey and then Bugs is doing this. I'm just thinking about playing the harmonica. And the once once I changed my thinking around that, it made the purpose of what I stored in the memory palace much clearer. Um one of one of the early things that I did with with changing the the specific use of of the building in question is rather than just take a, a, a room or a, or a house or a building that I knew well, I would go to a building that familiarized myself enough with its structure that I would have these kind of built-in markers of you know if I needed something from his uh, of a historical reference I could in the history room i wouldn't have to add a conversion of sorts for for those kinds of steps and then adding in the the overall purpose of that to be its use as opposed to just its storage means i'm now in the, purely from a subjective opinion bear in mind i'm i'm better equipped to question the kind of information that i'm going to use and i'm not just storing things for the sake of them you know i'm i'm making sure that every aspect of of the palace itself has a purpose and is is going to be is going to have this kind of utilitarian uh, practice towards it, which would ultimately mean that I'm going to be more effective in the moment because the chance, the probability of me having to go on, however quick the journey might be, to, to find the kind of information that I need could prevent me from missing things in the moment. Right. right. It was, it was my job is now so focused on uh, the observation of information. So if I could worry less about where things were stored and more about my ability to take in, then I'm better suited to the kind of uh, situation that I'm in. So, uh, again, progression, progression, right? Once you, once you develop a memory palace and you're like, this is going to be my palace, you think about uh, uh, storing the information. I, this... I, I don't remember the exact wording, no pun intended, of of the Arthur Conan Doyle quotes. But um, you know, you know, I can I consider a man's brain originally as like an empty attic, and he chooses to fill it with such lumber uh, that he sees fit, or, or words to that effect. Mm. And um, so, yeah, it was it was very much of a, a of a of a similar vein that I want my palace to be as empty uh, as it can be, because that would ultimately mean that I know more because it's gone through this this process of uh of of use that way around yeah, yeah. so that's, that's really how that's grown for me personally well it makes sense to me i mean not not to pick bones with with fictional characters but the thing <laughs> the thing with the sherlock stuff that never really made sense to me is the idea that you have to go into a memory palace to find stuff because it's used historically as as a kind of spaced repetition machine. I mean, Aristotle describes it quite well. It's like the whole point is to revisit it in such a way that it enters long-term memory. And it's, it's, I don't know why that's lost from so much of the teaching. <laughs> but maybe that's because it's the it's the it's the it, it's the effort part. Uh, it's effortful. Um, and you have to be yeah. maybe mindful of of doing that part. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, it it was one of those things that I you know I I think uh, BBC Sherlock has has a lot to answer for in that way in that it it gave the practice of the mind palace the memory palace this kind of um, intellectual sex appeal almost mm. and right. this this kind of intellectual celebrity status of oh my god I've got a mind palace you must be a genius like Sherlock Holmes. Not, not really. <laughs> not unless you don't know how to use it. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, it's uh, I, I, I could never conceive, of, you know, very much in, in agreement with yourself. I could never conceive of a situation where I'm going to sit there and go, right, I'm going in through my front door. I'm going in. I don't understand how that how that benefits me in, in that moment. So I wanted it more like. Um, you know, a gigantic memory utility belt. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that yeah. way, yeah. 
it's such an interesting thing. I mean, I, I think that you can understand this, I think, quite well as a mentalist and a performer. Like, no matter how good you are with the memory techniques, there's still like this huge margin of error. And, you know, this is this is perhaps partly why the best mentalists have, have multiple outs, <laughs> which we'll leave it to people who don't know what that means to look it up. But um, the the thing that, that sort of comes to mind about it all with with Sherlock and the fantasies of it is that it never leaves room for what are you going to do when you are a human and you make mistakes? You know, what is the thing that you do that last final move that the samurai has to execute even with his head cut off. You know, how, how do you, and, and let me frame this a different way. How do you, as someone who actually does what I understand to be actual detection, you know, how do you prepare yourself to do that, that perfect move when you are <laughs> engaged in this and maybe say what, I know you can't say that much about it, but um, you know, what, what is it that you, that you do in, in the actual detection of things? It's for me. It's about. It's not about. Not in any kind of a self-help analogy way, but it's not about fearing failure. Mm. Uh, for me, for me, fa failure doesn't exist. In that, it's it's either I'm going to be onto something, or I'm going to learn something else about what I've seen. Right. Right. And and it's it's very easy to say that change that internal dialogue that you talk to yourself in and everything will be fine cool that's that's an easy thing to say how do you how do you get to it in that moment it's 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 you know it's very difficult to say like i'm going to memorize this deck of cards in 30 seconds whatever it is and then you're only on about cards i don't know 24 25 is there's a few seconds left oh god and the <laughs> panic starts to get in and you're not really focused on the method but you know the things are, are, are analogous in that way um so what i'm really doing is framing the information that i see as such that it's only ever going to show me more Right, I'm. I'm. There's no predetermined singular right answer until the person or persons that I'm working with in that moment, whether it be somebody sat across the proverbial table or somebody on the same side, confirms irrefutably that this hypothesis that I've drawn has has gone into it. Right, and, you know, I'm. I am by no means a, a, a scientist at all, but I would imagine the application of the scientific process isn't, I have this hypothesis, I have one experiment that proves this, so this must be true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you, you know, interactions with human beings also don't function in this way. If you put in the same... Uh, you know, uh, predetermined antecedents, you know, of uh, being late for work and it raining that day. The same one person that goes through those situations will have seven different experiences of that over the week, you know, which will t determine, you know, 365 different experiences of it over the year. So you, you change that understanding around the way that information is communicated to you and it helps you to approach it a little bit more uh, rationally. I, I think I think would be the best way, the best way of looking at it. You know, just because somebody uh, you know twitches an eyebrow or or, or, or touches their nose in a moment <laughs> doesn't aut automatically indicate anything, really, mm -hmm. other than they have twitched their eyebrow or they've touched their nose. Whereas if they keep doing it. And the time changes and other things change with that. And there is a shift in the dynamic of their movement. Well, I need, I need to have initially paid attention to all of that to know that there's been a shift in that. But at that stage, I can then question it. And does it automatically mean that they're hiding things? No, I've, I've, you know, it's as unpleasant as it might be to say out loud. I've, what's the PC term? I've interviewed just as many um, cocaine 
addicts mm -hmm. that have a fondness for for playing with their nose, as I have people who are hiding things, you know, uh, as I have cat owners who who I find that their the cat hair tends they tend to start right, this right. approach. It seems to it seems <laughs> to collect around their nose. Is is there any kind of Cat Kane? That's a new name. Cat Kane. Yeah. Is there any kind of scientific reason for it collecting in the nasal pattern? Who knows? And that's mm. just merely an observation that I've made over uh, over time exploring that information. Uh, mm. are, are you just, are you okay? Yeah, just cat hair is the usual reaction you get in this uh, in in those uh, in in those moments. But yeah, it's 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 really about approaching a situation with certainty is to approach it with a predetermined bias mm. and that's 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 really uh the most succinct way that i can think of describing it if i've already um you know let's 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 say for example if if we were going to sit down and, and have this conversation and i've already sat down thinking God, he's he's gonna think this way of me because I'm wearing a a, a crazy shirt and you know a, a hat and I'm, I'm covered in tattoos and oh God, then I've already predetermined a framework for how I'm going to look at your interactions and anything that you say or do or move or suggest mm -hmm. that is even slightly related to that kind of opinion, I'm going to connect to it and it's it's going to be confirmed. Uh, when I when I uh, I, I did um, Neil deGrasse Tyson's masterclass on the masterclass dot com program website, whatever it's called, when he was talking about uh, scientific thinking, and he, uh, he came up with this story around um, intellectual laziness. Mm. In that, if somebody came to you and said, "I have this crystal; it's capable of curing disease; it's wonderful. Here you go." in that it is just as intellectually lazy to say that's nonsense it's a crystal what are you talking about as it is to say oh my god thank you for curing my disease yeah yeah you know it, it would be it would be more uh, rational in those moments to say what disease are there any precursors for it do i need to use it in a particular way where's your where's your background for this how long have you had it you know all of these kind of things that come about it so it it, st it stops me being less accepting of the potential mm. for bias in that way. If I accept that there are variables for for everything, you know, there's there's what eight billion of us, seven billion of us on the planet now, which would mean that we can come together and interact with anyone or anything in. But it's also a multiple of that, right? Because we also have the memory of memory of the dead. We have the archives of of the dead. We have like many, many people with us beyond the living. There's also the image of the people yet to come, which is a huge problem, yeah. right? Because there's all kinds of people running around with all kinds of hysteria yeah. for the people yet to come, and yeah. uh, you know, I don't judge that, but th that is a thing that's happening. But I'm glad you mentioned this intellectual laziness because. I find that there's a there's a there's there's something of a trap there also though, because a lot of my recent research is n equals one, and it is precisely me shaving away at my own bias against woo woo right. So, mm. and I've been at this for quite some years now. So it's like, oh, yeah. memorizing Sanskrit can stop your thoughts. Let's see how much Sanskrit yeah. do I have to memorize, and you know, I keep going all these years later. And then <laughs> I, I I just have these inclinations to say, oh, okay, so you believe that, I don't know, thinking these particular thoughts will make you more successful. And rather than just rejecting it as nonsense, then I just think, okay, mm. let, let, let's experiment with this. Let's see how that goes. And then the, then the problem is, I think, but maybe it's just as simple as confirmation bias. But nonetheless, these things sort of show up and there's no split test. There's no way to sort of have two of me 
to have it the other way without that, even though I could say, you know, there's all these years where I had all these successes, let's call them, uh, <laughs> before doing this. But anyway, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know exactly where to go with that. But what fascinates me about it, and it kind of comes back to this idea of signifying by distraction, yeah, is that even if they don't know it, I think they're being quite scientific about it, about how they go through it. So here's one thing I kind of want to keep it private until I write the whole book about it. But here's the thing that I think you'll get a kick out of in my recent experiment. <laughs> so I won't keep it so private. But there's a guy who has this ad campaign that I was able to stumble across because I was literally trying to get Facebook to show me particular kinds of ads. So, and okay. It did, <laughs> but I didn't know just, <laughs> just just how how the targeting works. Anyway, so I wound up in this rabbit hole world of somebody who actually markets a program for people who are obsessed with the idea that in a past life, they may have been persecuted or even worse, they may have okay. been the persecutor. Now, oh, to me- okay. This is so wild because I'm working on this memory detective series, as you know, and I don't want to give away yeah. too much, but part of it is going to be essentially that the detective Williams thinks his best friend Jerome is the reincarnation of Bruno and Jerome, as smart as he is, as intellectual as he is, he starts to be slowly influenced by this. And like, what if I am the reincarnation of Bruno? I will be burned, you know, like, cause history yeah. has to repeat itself. Every incarnation. Anyway, the thing that, that really bothers me about messing around with this stuff is then I'm doing this research on woo woo stuff. And then all of a sudden I get this ad, the persecution <laughs> imprint. And I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> now, I think I have a very logical answer to all of this stuff, right? Which is that there's cool. only so many things under the sun and yes, there's yeah. got to be a guy who talks <laughs> about this particular fantasy because <laughs> there's all kinds of people who are obsessed with reincarnation cool. or believe that it's real and yeah. so forth. But it starts to grind away at you. It's like the danger of the research. And so mm. I'm thinking of all this because partly you sound very, very grounded and not getting carried away with false positives or positive positives yeah. or all that sort of stuff. Like, how do you manage it? Because I'm finding it increasingly difficult not to just like don't jump off the deep end and then all of a sudden just say, <laughs> it's all real. Everything that every weirdo guru says, it must be real. Because it's look, all true. It's all true. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's just so weird to me, though. I can't, I mean, I can't, yeah. account, I can't account for it because the large of law numbers just kind of makes it obvious to me recursion Absolutely. in in how information becomes, you know, or how data becomes information, et cetera. It's just like, but at the same yeah. time, it's so damn seductive. So, you know, how do you keep yourself oh, God, yeah. out, out from there's, jumping off the cliff yourself? There's a, yeah, there's, there's, there's a question that came out of a, a, a super forecasting thing that I did a, a mm. while back. All right. And uh, it was, um, what if I'm wrong? Right. Just what if I'm wrong? Not, I might be wrong. I think I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. There's, there's, there's too much emotion connected to that kind of concept. But if I'm just thinking, what if I'm wrong? Mm. I'm, I'm continually curious. All right. There's, there's, there's always more to see. And if there's always more to see, then I can never be set in anything. There are, there are ways that work for me. Absolutely. Like, you know, as, as a, uh, this will show you how long I've been drinking coffee for. But as a child, <laughs> I, uh, I I used to I used to take uh, sugar in in my coffee. I don't anymore. Right? That's 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 something that's changed. And now, when I think about having sugar in my coffee, or I accidentally, you know, kind of na uh, narrow mindedly, uh, uh, absent mindedly, excuse me, uh, uh, pop one in, and then drink it, it doesn't taste right. Does that mean that both are true or none are true uh, in in those moments? So it's just, well, what if I'm wrong? I may, maybe it's nice, <laughs> right. and it and it, it makes it more palatable in those moments, you know. So if if I've 
uh, it, it, you know, if I've seen all of the, and, and don't get me wrong, I've I've had moments that could be described as you know inherently Sherlocky uh, <laughs> in 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 that way where like um uh i uh, when i i I, t I tell this story a lot so it's 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 at the forefront when i walked into a, a doctor's surgery years ago in, in for a, an asthma clinic checkup or something like that it was it was kind of run of the mill and um I, I i looked at a water bottle and then i asked her when her daughter's weddings uh, her daughter's wedding was that was what i observed that that led me to that conclusion she was dumbfounded by the experience. But when I tell that story, that's creating one belief. But I could also tell that story with recounting every individual step that led me. Because, you know, I can remember every individual step that led me to that conclusion, mm. which creates a very different belief of the experience, which is very Sherlockian in the way that, you know, how oh, the devil do you know that, Holmes? And then he would describe all of his ways and Watson would go, oh, that's that's perfectly normal. Yeah. <laughs> right? So it, it, in in kind of doing my best to maintain the, you know, the the the, the kind of shield against the allure of, uh, of, of this kind of thing, I'm always asking myself, what if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong? Because there is a there is a malleability to that. If I've come up with an answer then where I've gone, that is it, that is set in stone then. And right. it becomes something that you know. And there was um there was a viral video that went round around this concept. I don't know of the exact context, but it was just this one thing that this guy said that stuck with me. Uh is is that you you can't believe something and know it at the same time. The, the the two things are at odds with one another, you know. And it, it wasn't it wasn't the truth of that sentiment that stuck with me. More its more its potential meaning, mm. you know. I I could I could believe that that I am a you know that I am this incredibly observant uh, individual that knows all of these things about all of these people and whatnot, or I could know. That I am this incredibly, uh, you know, whatever, whatever else it was that I just said. One offers opportunity for growth; the other does not. And I'm, I'm of the opinion that, that you know, this proverbial expert status doesn't exist. There's, there's always more to see. There's always more to learn. There's always more to know. There's always more to grow and develop, particularly when it comes to, you know, cerebral skills. But would you say what, that this whatever. is kind of a form of falsifiability? Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, yeah. I think people have forgotten that falsifiability, if you're really going to do it, it's got to be total. Like you even have to falsify the idea of falsifiability. Like you got to try, right? Um, if it's going to actually be worthy of the term falsifiability. So, uh yeah, that's that's fascinating. I think that's really important. A good way to keep your head screwed on. Um, yeah, I, I it, it, well, speaking purely from a subjective experience, it's it's certainly stopped me from drinking my own Kool Aid. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and because I'm very clear about my my passions within this area. Uh, as as very clear as I feel that I can be with myself, mm. uh, if 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 that makes sense. In that I only want these techniques of all, you know, uh, this the, you know the adjacent fields uh, to uh, to be nurtured and developed and used and mm. inquired uh, about. The second I take any kind of a a, 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 a personal grandstand within that the techniques are hurt so you know whether it be you know I, I choose to think of the techniques as my family in that way and i want my family to grow you know that's that's a good that's a good rationale for me in in, in that way which which makes me laugh when um you know people claim to be number one in this area voted most in this area 100 percent in this area there's there's no olympics for for this kind of cerebral notion you know outside of uh, you know memory competitions uh, uh, and the like 
so you can be you can be number one that year <laughs> yes you know but, but, but does that make you number one continuously the best unbeatable no <laughs> no i mean david slew goliath after all you know <laughs> yeah that's the funny thing with records they tend to set the stage for being demolished eventually or broken exactly. yeah exactly where do you fall on things like I, I, part of what i think is interesting in the idea of growth is that in the in the the battles between rationality and irrationality reason and whatever the opposite of reason is i guess it's you know intuition <laughs> or you know, yeah. I, I i feel that it's true you know that sort of thing um yeah where do you fall on some of the like checkmate claims in science about there is no individual identity the, the i is a complete illusion and there is no free will like the recent robert sapolsky book determined he's just like it ain't happening like i put my foot down <laughs> on all the forms of free will you know, you don't even know that there's just different forms of free will. And, you know, it, it reminds me of that line from Nietzsche. I laugh at your free will and your unfree will, too. <laughs> but where do, where, where do you stand on all of that, especially when you're dealing with investigations and 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 you, you potentially, I imagine, people who are are guilty of things, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh a free will is a is a is a very interesting thing uh from a from a research status i i love it just just mm -hmm. as, a, as a side note whether it be you know benjamin libe right the way through to sapolsky and everyone in between mm -hmm. I, I i love to read about that kind of thing it's 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 so interesting but um uh, personally speaking it's 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 stoicism that com that comforts that comforts me mm -hmm. in you know the um the, the 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 kind of there are two things uh, in life that pop up things we can solve and things we can't why worry about either in that way so if okay. if sapolsky has said that free will forget about it cool that's that's sapolsky's belief structure around that and there will be information within those books that i can use when the situation presents itself mm -hmm. you know uh, le, le said this great you know <laughs> this person said this this person said this i'm 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 of the opinion that these these types of things are fluid in that for every person that says free will doesn't exist there'll be the same amount of people that say it does right and and the, the the kind of arguments that go back and forth until until somebody on these particular topics that can come up with something irrefutable along the same lines that two plus two is four mm. you know along those, those same veins i mean i've seen some people that argue that two plus two is five as well and they are they are very interesting to listen to uh, as uh, without judgment, but it's it's nice hearing that kind of uh, <laughs> A to Z through Sanskrit <laughs> kind of a <laughs> kind of pro a, approach to a, a, a arriving at a conclusion. So I'm 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 I try to remain as accepting of whatever it is that the world wants to show me. Mm. I I have no connection to decide whether my own free will exists or not, which could be an answer to that kind of question <laughs> as to whether my free will exists or not. But um, I, I have no uh, personal stake in, in a lot of these kind of bigger ideas that come around. If somebody presents some kind of seemingly useful premise, then in order for me to know if it works for me, I have to go and I have to go and try it. Mm -hmm. I have to go and I have to go and test it. You know, like the the, the first time that I saw um, Johnny Lee Miller in elementary look at all of those TV screens uh, and and know what was going on on them all. I was like, that looks cool. Can it be done? You know. So I I, I sat down with a bunch of screens and had a go, 
in in in, in it providing provided me with the, the the personal knowledge and growth um in, in that area as a result so when we're looking at growth all i'm really referring to in that way is is educated you know uh, i i don't have the I like my opinion is that i don't have the position to determine right from wrong i'm i'm simply presenting my findings whether that be in an investigation or in a in a, in a book or you know or, or whatever else it is i'm simply saying here is what i've learned please go and see if it fits your reason for asking me to do it right, right. <laughs> yeah you know? well It seems to me there's a, I think it's called a Sorites paradox, right? Because, uh, and the easy or, or the fast way to make that visual is like, when, do, when does a grain become a heap, a grain of salt become a heap <laughs> of salt, right? And then in order to like work all that out, you have to label a thing and then you have to label the thing that you've just labeled. So if you say to me, well, I saw this thing on a show. And then I just had to go and find out for myself if I could track 15 screens or whatever number of screens it is, right? Well, then to me, that's like the evidence that there is no free will, right? Because you just had to go and do it, right? So who, who is the I that has to go do it? This is like a tendency that is actually driving the machine as opposed to the machine yeah. or the mind driving. But then, you know, I take into account your label of it and then I label your label and then it just, you know, becomes... Like the question of like, when does a little yeah. speck of salt become a heap of salt? Is it three pieces of salt? Is it 10? You know, like that sort of thing. There was, there was um, a, a wonderful show that kind of connected to that idea. I show it as a theatrical thing. Mm -hmm. It was, um, I think it's on Disney plus as well. It's uh, uh, Derek Del Gordio's in and of itself. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. It is a magic show. But the kind of questions it asks of these kind of labels that we place onto ourselves or others place on us in, in that way. You know, somebody could look at me and think I am X, Y and Z because they've observed, you know, the, 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 the crazy shirt, the tattoos, the hats, whatever it is. Uh, and I could think I am X, Y and Z because of the crazy shirt, the tattoos, the hat, whatever it is, and arrive at two very different points of information. Both are equally true in that moment, just observed from uh, from from different standpoints at that time. And, and the kind of point that he makes in the show is for one of the one of the routines that he does is the, the the connection towards identity. He builds out this story of when he was in Spain, uh, somebody uh, referred to him as the Rulatista. And there's this whole story connected to of what the Rulatista is. And then he starts to talk about his life and his experiences. And I used to think I was this, you know, I used to think I was a card mechanic. I used to think I was, you know, a speaker. I used to think I was a teacher. I used to think, and the truth is I'm all of those things. Right. It's it's just that in in any one moment it's it's pulled upon. There was um there was a course that that I went on uh, in in London a good number of years ago. And um it's it's one I, I wrote about in the in the in the second version actually, when it, it comes to that apparent holy grail of looking at somebody and knowing what they do for a living. And it's it's a question that I get asked loads just because of 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 homes in that way and this uh, i'm talking to this this gentleman he's from brazil uh, and we're talking about um you know the day's events and what we learned and what our our funnest uh, fondest experiences were from that day uh, and then he just came out with so what do i do for a living then i was like <laughs> well, you're a sales i was like well, well you're a salesman he was like no no that's that's not true i was like oh, fair enough so what is it what is it that you do for a living then It was like, well, uh, me and my friend, we we run a business uh, based around uh, medicine, where he is the coach that he would go into uh, these different uh, resources and institutes and teach on various medical topics. And I, I go to the businesses and I get him the opportunity to be able to go in and do that. So uh, which led to me saying, so you're a salesman then, <laughs> 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 you know, in, in that way, which 
which he disagreed with initially, but mm -hmm. that's that's where that kind of uh, perception argument comes from in, in in that way. And I, whether it's a rationalization or not, I don't think I'm capable of outthinking that at this stage, but I, I'm comfortable with accepting that both are true. You know, I'm 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 comfortable with accepting that, and you know, I'm I'm having Neo from Matrix Three uh, uh, pop up in my head. You know, why, Mister Anderson? Why do you persist? Because I choose to. It's what works for me yeah. in in that moment. I'm, am I am I saying am, am I saying that it's the right way or the only right way? Mm. No, I'm I'm saying it's a way. To get towards information that you can use in in field X and situation Y. Uh, that's interesting. I always think that Agent Smith is the actual one, you know, because he's he's the guy. At least in part one, part three is a different story. Well, off the rails. <laughs> <laughs> well I, I mean, I, I could probably do an extended argument, but uh, the, the the long and short of it is, is that. Agent Smith is the one who knows that he is made out of the prison that he's in. He's not separate from it. And so even when he escapes, it's just a repetition of the same problem. He's he's material now, and he's made yeah. out of the same material that he wants to escape. So it's just like, <laughs> of course, he's the one because he's the one who realizes it. But Neo never realizes that. Neo is just following the prophecy. You know, Morpheus said, you have to be going all the way to Machine City or whatever it's called there. And, you know, to patching in and doing the Christ thing. And, uh, and then we end with Wizard of Oz, right? Which is precisely back to the world of illusion. Whereas the resolution is that the one dissipates into the thing that he always knew that he was. <laughs> No, I, I completely agree. It's one of the reasons that I love the character of Deadpool so much. Right. Is that he know he knows he was created for somebody else's enjoyment. That's part of where his kind of tragedy and comedy comes from in right, that right. way. And that there is there is a freedom in knowing that that none of the other characters really have. You know, we could we could get into the nuts and bolts, as you say, and do an extended analysis of it. But we'll have to see how it goes with Wolverine in the mix. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I can imagine him being separated, pun very much intended, into yeah, yeah. various different viewpoints. Leave it to uh, a Canadian yeah, it, to bring the the bring the real the real weight. <laughs> absolutely, right. Both of them. I think. Uh, I oh think, yes. Um, Wolverine was a Canadian as well, wasn't he? Well, yeah. Well, so. Is it Ryan Reynolds who plays Deadpool? Oh yeah, Ryan. Ryan's, think... uh, Ryan's Canadian. I think yeah. he as an actor is a Canadian, but I don't know if Deadpool the yeah. character is Canadian, but I think Wolverine the character is a Canadian. But yeah, I think, he is. Yeah, I yeah. think Hugh Jackman is is not. <laughs> no, Hugh Jackman's Australian. No, yeah. <laughs> he looks Canadian. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's got that kind of uh, ruggedness as if, about it. As if there is such a thing. Um <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I don't know uh I think the interesting question to me that's come out of this, if we just can hang on to free will just a second longer or yeah. multiple seconds longer, as people who share a common interest and in knowledge in mentalism or magic, that sort of thing, but specifically mentalism, mentalism almost it, it, it would challenge the idea of, of free will to an extent because... Well, maybe not, because that's this is where the whole multiple outs thing comes. Where, well, like if you if if you if there was no free will, you would have thought by now there would be a mentalist so flawless that they, you wouldn't need uh, any sort of alternative path. But then, part of why mentalism exists, if we were going to put our Darwin hats on. Is because we need the fantasy of a controller, of a mastermind who can see all possible outcomes. So what basically what this is leading to me is, is that when when you think about it at scale, there may be a larger free will. Maybe it's not in an individual that there's such a thing as free will, but in groups, there may be the will of groups that exerts a certain pressure, which would then, you know, like the real heavy hitter mentalists, they will have memorize certain things about demographics and psychographics that 
really help them with that M is, is your grandma's first name. Maybe start with an M because they, you know, they, they've looked at how many M's were in the population, you know, weighted against names that start with R like that. That's, that's like real deal stuff. Right. And it's, uh, it, it is will at scale. If you know what I'm saying, like yeah. that a, a species oh, yeah. would distribute the naming of characters so that in a certain generation, 15% is all names that start with M and the rest is just in the, in the seven and 3% range or whatever. I, I, no, I, I, absolutely. I, I think a lot of it has to do as well with uh, the, the, the kind of part that emotion plays in, in it. You know, if, right. if we are, if we are to examine free will, can we, can we, and I'm asking a question that I don't know the answer to, can we examine it? without the entanglement of emotion because does the entanglement of emotion predetermine that it's been influenced by other things and experiences that would inform your decision and that's where you know the kind of uh, a concept falls apart can we truly make an emotion free decision you know and i'm a, I, i'm drawn back to a, a game that me and a, ma a magician friend of mine used to play where we would have these kinds of uh, thought exercises of you know we put four cards on a table a ace ace to three and you know ask uh, uh, each other to think of them uh, think of one and like turn them over and see if we turned over the right one that the other person was thinking of mm. in, in that way and it, it led to uh, various kind of reactions of well that's neat when we did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. right that's that's a neat little thing but with with you with you saying uh, about the connection to the, the the larger group, when we tried it with ten, we felt differently about it. When we tried it with twenty six, we felt differently uh, uh, about that particular connection. So, you know, wh whether there is something within that that we can maybe maybe look to attempt to to, to separate the two from mm -hmm. to to see if if there is a different version of free will that exists without the entanglement that emotion provides in that way you know uh, even if it was a home saying it, the emotional qualities are antagonistic to clear reason um i i, I always say that the, the the qualities of emotion are not right because if if i understand the way my my emotion makes decisions then uh i'm I feel like I'm capable of being rational, which is in and of itself an oxymoron. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? It's yeah. that's that's what it is in 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 that way. So yeah, it's 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 a it's a fun little debate uh, mm -hmm. around uh, 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 because I, I I certainly think that I'm not capable uh, of answering that question. I've you know I've I've read Sapolsky stuff, uh, and I don't think that I'm in a position where I can determine. That that free will isn't uh, isn't or is something, and that is largely because I've read <laughs> I've read S Sapolsky's Sapolsky's book. Uh, uh, oh God, that was a very stoky way of saying uh, uh, book. Excuse me, uh, Stoke on Trent. The part of the world is one of the only people that say book, Luke, Cook. <laughs> terrible, terrible way of using English. I apologize. That slipped out. Um, <laughs> well, uh, but yeah. That 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 reminds me. One of the things in the monographs, and I don't know if it continues in the new version, but uh, maybe it would, maybe not. And then it would encourage people to have both. You talk about accents, accent recognition, and so forth. And <laughs> a friend of mine the other day, he's like, I, I, I think that we should really call the Buddha the Buddha, and then. <laughs> <laughs> and and talk about buddhism <laughs> Buddha. Buddha. I thought that, that was really interesting because you know he did he didn't actually follow through with yeah what that should mean to change to change i thought of ghosts and halloween and all this sort of stuff but he did he didn't condition it but nonetheless <laughs> you like to, to just kind of ask you about it you know yeah what 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 about accents can 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 we derive from people beyond just oh uh, you're from Manchester or what have you if there it's, is a Manchester accent oh yeah there is very very much so if you if you're familiar with the band Oasis 
Oh yes, uh, yeah. uh, yeah, the Gallagher brothers. They're they're from Manchester. Okay. Um, but yeah, for for me, it's about connection to culture. Okay, If yeah, yeah. if I know a little bit more about the culture of that particular place, I'm I'm not saying. Uh, with with accents that you know you are from Manchester, therefore uh, I, don't, I don't know you support Manchester United or whatever it is, uh, <laughs> whatever it is in that way. What I can say about uh, uh, males between the ages of eighteen to thirty four that if they fit a sporty demeanour and have uh, a Mancunian accent, that that there is a very strong possibility that they will be football fans because of how popular it is within the culture of Manchester. So, you know, in in recognising if somebody has a Canadian accent or if recognising that somebody has a, a, a Stoke-on-Trent accent, mine, mine, mine changes every now and again. My, my, my Stokey-isms will, will leak out, which is, if you, if you listen to my accent, that's because I initially trained. My first job was as an actor years ago. And so I, I went through the, the, the kind of uh, the vocal training regimen that tries to uh, alter how you speak so you can project and uh, enunciate and these kind of elocution demands that are placed on you when you follow a kind of a Shakespearean regimen uh, that way around. But e either way, if you were to hear me and then book leaps out, you know that has a as an apparent Stokey twang. You connect that to the other areas of, and you have two cultures with which you can connect information to that you can interact with me uh, uh, in a more in a more uh, uh, directed and purposeful way. If if your purpose was to validate, dismiss, or clarify these kinds of things that you've got in your head as a result, because you can't ultimately say this person said book uh, book. Can't even do it on purpose now. This this person <laughs> said book, therefore uh, they are from Stoke because it could just as easily be, you know, some kind of slip of the tongue, mm. right? Could just as easily be, a, you know, a, a flawed word. <laughs> you know, there was uh, it's it's connected to you know the kind of Freudian slips and the paraparaxisms that way. Uh, I I saw an interview uh, for the cast of Dune Two with uh Florence Pugh she was talking about the you know the film and this this very uh, the, the the most important and specific fart uh, part and like does that does that mean that she had farts on the brain no it did. Okay. it was just a it was just a, a slip of the tongue that way so the same with accents what i what i like to do is a way to kind of expand my knowledge of the world because there are certain places that either I can't afford to go to or I've never been or I can't get to because, you know, they they don't allow travel or whatever. But there, there is certain information that exists online that I can educate myself uh, about the way it, about the way life is like in that way. But obviously, free will comes back. Somebody's written this position. How objective are they in doing that? So I take the information with... Uh, as as much of a pinch of salt as is possible, which again connects to the what if I'm wrong and keeps me curious about the kind of information that I'm seeing. So if it is that somebody has, uh, uh, you know, a, a Canadian accent, you know, I'm I'm not thinking about something as 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 trite and cliche as I don't know Tim Hortons, uh, <laughs> as, as, you know, something along those lines. I'm I'm thinking more about what it is to live in canada because canada is massive <laughs> it's is actually massive. really just about tim hortons that's that's all it is <laughs> <laughs> fair enough good to know good to know <laughs> well but yeah I mean, so I, I say that with humor but there there is a little bit of truth to it <laughs> Not yet. That's that's where these tropes come from you know yeah, that yeah. uh, my, my friend who uh, he, he performs as a uh, I don't know what you call it, like a like a tarot card reader, but like an honest tarot card reader. He's not saying that the the cards indicate these, but he's saying what I learned in a book uh, about card reading says this about you. And right. he, he, he does, does he have a, a justification a for why that book is the one that he uses? He he, he just uh, books uh, books oh, more okay. so. I was just uh, more more to describe his frame of mind right. more so than anything. Um, uh, and he, his lecture is called uh, Stereotypes Exist for a Reason. 
Mm. And you know that there are there are for every for every you know muscle bound meathead applying fake tan uh, in in the middle of a gymnasium that is only obsessed with themselves and the vain way that their body is projected. There is another meathead, the you know, <laughs> applying fake tan and lifting weights, who is you know working towards their PhD. Mm. Well, you know, <laughs> in that way. So the stereotypes can can give us some kind of insight into something. Uh, in the same way that culture can give us some kind of insight into something. The notion of Tim Hortons coming out of its popularity within Canada. You know, mm. it doesn't mean that all of the other tropes are true, like the finishing every sentence with. A and the like, and being you know a really the, 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 overtly cheerful and the like. I worked for a gambling company uh, a good number of years ago, and every time a, a Canadian person rang up, uh, they were the most irritable individuals that we'd we'd ever spoken to on the planet, effing and jeffing the whole time. And you, yeah, okay, all right, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's 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 things uh, to and fro with that. It just depends on what what your what your starting point is. I can't determine what the first thing is that I'm going to observe about an individual. It might be how they speak. It might be their accent. It might be the way that they write certain words. It might be their body language, the objects that they carry with them. So if all of that is capable of communicating something to me, then my interaction with them is going to be more uh, informed as a result. Yeah, that's interesting stuff. I, I I pay a lot of attention to the way people enunciate what yeah what their cadence is. So it's not just necessarily yeah. the 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 accent. And I'm 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 I've become quite aware of my own, but I couldn't do an interpretation or a impersonation of myself. That would be too difficult. Even though I've sort of now seen my own strange <laughs> yeah. patterns uh, so many times from watching so many videos of myself and listening to podcasts and so forth. But I think it's, it's a super fascinating topic and I'm glad you covered it. And I, I'm, I'm rather for whatever reason biased towards the no free will absolutism. So I would say that I really wish for as many people as possible to read the monographs so that they can as you mentioned, come across these ideas and then absolutely have to go and try them. Uh, <laughs> I know that that we 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 don't have the conductor that conducts all things, but that's part of why we do read books and so forth is so that we might be okay. urged towards some change. You know, so I, I think this is yeah. a, a great opportunity to do that and a great opportunity to catch up. Is that thank you uh, very much for saying that? Is that a fair hope, or do you have a different one? <laughs> no, no, I, I think, I think that's, I think that's a very fair hope. I think that's a very fair hope. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So, the the you you had a immediately successful Kickstarter for the new version yeah. of the monographs. <laughs> yeah, and it was it done. Was, it Faster. was it was fully funded in twelve hours. Yeah, I was it like seemed fast. Uh, it almost almost felt like a kind of pseudo celebrity status. I was sat looking at my phone the next morning, like, "Oh, <laughs> um, yeah." So my, uh, my publisher added something on that if we get to um, uh, fifty backers, then he gives all of the backers uh, five free codes to uh, download audio books, of which uh, of which the first monographs uh, could could be one of them, and. Um, the 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 audiobook version of the of the monographs is to listen to objectively be, speaking about voices and accents uh, and the like the gentleman that did that did the reading for it is very uh, he has a refined english accent he's very profound in his uh, description of whatever else it is that he speaks about and it's right. just great to listen to you know it's it's great well it's a poor man's attempt at it at, at, at impersonating him but yeah it's uh kickstart has been a, a whole kind of learning curve uh, uh for me in that way and uh you know how do you how do you put out a trailer for a for a book 
how, how does that work? Right, right, right. <laughs> well, what, what, what would you do? And so we, we put one on there, and yeah, it seems to have it seems to have gone uh, bananas. Yeah, mm. absolutely bananas. Well, I mean, the monograph is well loved. I, I was looking at the listing on Amazon, and there's many, many reviews in the hundreds. And yeah, I mean. People love it. They absolutely adore it. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's 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 a wonderfully humbling experience. Wonderfully mm -hmm. humbling. Well, I'm excited to see what happens yeah. in the the new version, and you know, we we have to find more, make more books or something, so we have more excuses <laughs> to record more podcasts. But thank you for doing this. Absolutely, my genuine pleasure. Thank you for having me, and thank you to everyone for listening. I want to thank Ben again for sharing with us some of the ideas in the monographs about how to observe things better, exercises you can do. I'm looking forward to the new material as well. And thank you for being part of this. You know, one of the things that is so important to me is to not just know about the importance of observation, but to continually practice observing the world. And it is something that is obviously not easy. It's challenging to do, but you can train yourself to do it. And the important thing is to get started. So this project with the monographs and how it's evolving over time is, is very, very exciting because it places a primacy on not just what to do, but help in how to do it through exercises that expand your ability to observe things. We demonstrated a little bit of how that works today in our conversation, Ben and I, but this, these things are, are not about just consuming new perspectives. It's about literally getting out there and doing it. So if you want more help along those lines, then, you know, get off the machine and go and read a book and then apply the ideas that are in those books or apply the ideas that are in the videos that you watch, etc. I have so many people who say, well, I watched these videos and it didn't improve my memory. It didn't improve my ability to think critically and so forth. And this is kind of sad because we're living in an era where the algorithms compel me to say, hey, you know what, you should watch this next video on my channel uh, about critical thinking. And, you know, that is in order to increase the amount of time you spend on the platform consuming the material, etc. Instead of getting out there and actually taking action so that you can improve your life. Because if you're not taking the action that improves your life, then what you're doing is you're consuming. <laughs> and improving the lives of others because they are now getting the benefit of your attention, which leads to you know, all kinds of things uh, that are not you being better. So get out there, take action. And these are the kinds of tools that I'm so passionate about because they actually give you things that you can do to take action. The book has exercises in it. And from what I understand, the next version of the monographs is going to update all of that. And I give all kinds of exercises all the time. But just thinking about exercises is not doing them unless they are thought exercises, which then need to be done. And there needs to be some challenge in there. So one of the things that I really, really admire about Ben is he has made videos of many, many challenges that he has undertaken. We didn't take uh, much time to talk about that today, but we have talked about it before and so if you do want to carry on and not take my advice to get out there and take action then you could carry on by watching our previous discussion which was actually you know fairly popular as far as things go on the magnetic mary method podcast and the link for that will be there but the same principle will apply go out take action take action take action and some of the simplest actions that you can do is just start to observe the world place what you observe in memory palaces and think a little bit about what we talked about today. That difference between data, how it becomes information, how you can organize information into knowledge, and then what you're going to do with that information to turn it into wisdom so you can better direct and guide your life. Free will is an interesting topic in there and I think we probably got somewhere not even remotely close to the bottom of it, but at least we tried and I think that's the Yoda moment, you know. Do or do not, there is no try. So, very long conclusion here to say the same thing over and over, 50 million times, but that is the job of the teacher. Repeat, repeat, repeat. It's the action that I take, but I only get to take it and talk about it in depth because 
I took action on the techniques that we talk about here in the Magnetic Mary Method world. Thank you again for joining me. Until we have a chance to speak again, thanks also to Ben Cardell, and keep yourself magnetic.